Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a discographic tribute to Maurice Abravanel. I think Abravanel is one of the most important and interesting figures in, in all of 20th century music as a conductor, for sure. He wasn't the most famous, but he made an amazing collection of recordings. And I know he's famous for doing like one of the first Mahler cycles ever, as well as complete cycles of Sibelius and Brahms. But that's not what we're going to talk about at least not what I'm going to talk about. I want to talk about the music he championed at a time when nobody else was doing it. And there's a lot of it that no one else still has done that's quite unique. And his background was really very unique. You know, Abravanel was born in 1903 in what was still then the Ottoman Empire. You know, the Ottoman Empire was around. I mean, it, it, we think of the Ottoman Empire when we think of it at all. And, you know, Mozart's The Abduction from the Seraglio, but it lasted like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, basically till World War I. And that's where he was born in what later became Greece. He was uh, born in a very, very illustrious Sephardic Jewish family, but he was a musician. He became a musician. As usual, his parents were opposed to him becoming a musician, but he did it anyway. And he wound up in Berlin studying with Kurt Weill during the Weimar Republic. But when the Nazis came to power, he left along with Kurt Weill and, and decamped to Paris, where he became something of a specialist in the music of Les Six, you know, that group of six important French composers who were all grouped around Eric Satie and Jean Cocteau and all those people. They were Poulenc and Mio and Honegger and, and you know, a, a bunch of people like that. You know, we'll, we'll talk about some of them. And then he wound up in the United States. And for reasons known best to himself, he wanted to build an orchestra. And so he found himself in Utah. Before then, he had been working on Broadway, doing a lot of court file productions and things like that. And you can find in original cast recordings of, you know, court file musicals and some others, the name Maurice de Abravanel. He had the de in his name until sort of the late 20s, or early 30s or somewhere around then. But he was, he was very well known as a composer of theatrical, I'm sorry, conductor of theatrical productions. Anyway, he wound up in Utah where he settled and was happy and wanted to build an orchestra that he could do with whatever he pleased. And he spent the next 30 plus years running the Utah Symphony, which he, he changed from basically a part-time community orchestra into a significant major symphony orchestra full of, you know, like real professional musicians. And they made lots and lots and lots of records for all, all of the labels. He did things for EMI, he did stuff for, you know, I mean, he was, he was around, but most importantly for the Vanguard label. And I'm gonna talk about some of those recordings. I'm not going to pay any attention to whether or not they were available or not. I just wanna show something of his range and some of the remarkable, remarkable recordings that he made that some of us who, you know, when we were growing up and collecting records in the 60s and 70s, had an opportunity to hear music that we never would have encountered otherwise. And a lot of his strengths were in this less usual repertoire. I mean, the Mahler symphonies were important for their period. And they were, some of them have still held up very well, especially, for example, the fourth and the eighth. But the Utah Symphony wasn't a great orchestra. And if you listen to his Sibelius and his Brahms and his Mahler, you just can't help but know that it's not a great orchestra. And they don't sound as good as other things by other great orchestras, and they've been superseded since. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation, especially today when there are so many recordings of basic repertoire. But these are things in which Abravanel stands alone. So I have here um, seven recordings. Since I'm in the overflow room, I could go and pull these things out from my shelves and talk to you about them. Talk to you about them. And it's really very exciting because I've had a wonderful time, you know, listening to some of these things again after many, many years and rediscovering not just my youth, but, you know, the, 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 the variety and extent of recorded music at a time when you were never going to hear these things performed live. You still don't, for the most part. So here they are. We get Darius Mio, the Pachem in Terrace Choral Symphony, 
and the cantata L'homme et son désir. This is really quite something else. When was the last time you heard this? Pachim in Terrace is a choral symphony which is based on text selected from the encyclical of the late Pope John the Twenty-Third, and it was recorded under Mio's own supervision. I mean, that's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, I just think that's like, wow, you know? And it's a wonderful work, and no one ever performs it, and here it is, from a Bravanel and the Utah Symphony. How extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, isn't it just marvelous? Because Abravanel really had his 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 sort of group of soloists and performers and composers who he worked with and who he championed his whole life. And he was the most loyal human being that ever lived when it came to that. Now we get, and this was this was a shocker when I first heard it. Verez. This is back in the days when no one did Verez. You have Emerick, Nocturnal, Equatorial, and Honegger Pacific 231 as a not insubstantial coupling. Now, the most amazing thing about this, in my point of view, is that Emerick is unbelievably good. This is one of the great recordings of Emerick, and it's sonically a knockout, absolutely a knockout. How he got the Utah Symphony to play this piece with this level of just sheer pedal to the metal excitement and, and record it with this sort of earth-shaking fidelity I don't know. But guys, I know that, you know, Pierre Boulez came along and all these like modern specialists came along and then Shai did all the Verez stuff. And, you know, nowadays performances of Emmerich are a dime a dozen. But this, when it came out, was something extraordinary. And it still is. I'm serious. Go find this Verez disc. You can download it. It's downloadable. And listen to it. It's, 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 wow, fantastic. Another composer he championed, and this was at a time when you didn't find a lot of this stuff, was Vaughn Williams, believe it or not. Now, yes, you know, there was Adrian Bolt in the UK, and you could get all the basic Vaughn Williams stuff on EMI. Not so much in this country. And Abravanel was doing Vaughn Williams, and not your standard everyday Vaughn Williams. I mean, there's a wonderful disc that had the uh, the Talus Fantasia and, and Floss Campy. I mean, you know, who did Floss Campy? But Abravanel did it, and on this disc, he did the Sixth Symphony. I mean, number six, you know? That was a toughie even, even in the Vaughn Williams cycle days, you know, in the 70s. And the, the cantata Dona Nobis Pachem. And these are first-rate performances. I mean, the sixth, this is one of the great performances of the sixth. It really is. It's just exciting as hell. And I was totally stunned to even find out that this existed. You know, I mean, who was doing these symphonies? American orchestras, especially in the 60s. I mean, remember, I mean, the 60s was the, you know, the height of academic serialist misery. And, and you know, nobody was going to play Vaughn Williams in the United States or really outside of the UK in the 60s. But Abravanel did it and he recorded it. And we are much the happier for that fact. Then there were his Honegger discs. His Honegger discs were just fantastic. I mean, his Pacific 231 is great, but he did the two big oratorios. He did Le Roi David, when, again, there, were, there was just no other way to get it. This was the way to get it. And it's absolutely first class. It has... Madeline Mio, the actress, Darius Mio's wife, as the Witch of Endor, which is like really, really, really cool. The soprano is Natanya Davroth, who's who was a knockout in his Mahler Four. She does the soprano solo in the finale of the Mahler Four, which makes that one of the great Mahler Fours. So she's in here, and this was the way that that so many of us discovered this this remarkable, remarkable work, a fabulous piece. In addition to which, he did Honegger's Judith. Judith, there it is, Judith. I mean, again, with Natanya Davroth and Madeleine Mio and, and Blanche Christensen, who he used in most of his vocal productions, mezzo-soprano. And this is coupled with an absolutely first-class Mio, La Création du Monde, Another work that was quite unfamiliar to American audiences at the time. I mean, I, I just, I loved getting to know these pieces, you know, from these recordings. They were so much fun. 
back in the day because you just, you never found them anywhere else. It was wonderful. He also has done, which for me still is the all-time great disc of Satie. Satie's orchestral works. You get Parade, Mercure, the complete ballet, and La Belle Excentrique, Cinq Grémas, these are orchestrations, Relâche, the complete ballet, the Gymnopédies, orchestrated by Debussy, the Morceau en forme de poire, orchestrated by Des Ormières, and, and the Jack in the Box, orchestrated by Mio. All of them. This is the best settee orchestral music album that you can find, period. Hands down, still is. It's, it's great, and I think it's probably still around. I'm hoping it is anyway. You know, I don't even know who, who makes Vanguard anymore, to be honest with you. But this was an absolutely fantastic disc. And last, but certainly not least, um, Abravanel championed throughout his career the music of Ernest Bloch. You know, there were two recordings of the Sacred Service available. There was his and then there was Bernstein's. I mean, that was it for this piece. And here you get the Israel Symphony. This was the only recording of the Israel Symphony for about, about, well, forever, decades, decades and decades and decades until like the 90s or something like that or the 80s. This is the one you got. It was the only one you could get. And it's excellent, absolutely superb. And it's coupled with a first class recording of Shlomo uh, with the marvelous cellist Zara Nelsova. You know, or Nelsova. But she was she was a marvelous cellist who worked who worked extensively with Abravanel. I, I you know, I just I just look at these and I it's not just that I have a tremendous feeling of nostalgia. I mean there was a here was a conductor who understood where he was in the world of music, you know? He had his ensemble and he used it to make wonderful, wonderful music and not just the standard stuff to explore the music that meant the most to him and in which he really could make a statement. He really had something to say. And he got his Utah forces more often than not to play splendidly. And these these were, were really, really landmark recordings. And they still are. They are absolute landmarks. I really recommend that you look for some of them if you can find them. You know, I mean, Mahler is a dime a dozen. Brahms and Sibelius, they're a dime a dozen these days. But you are not going to find Mio and Bloch and Onager and, and you know, Therese. And this is, this is, this was great stuff. Even as Vaughn Williams, quite special and very different from what you hear coming out of the UK. Not better, not worse, just different. Just his own personal view. A great, great, great musician. Abravanel died in 1993. He lived long enough to see, you know, the Utah Symphony permanently installed at its own concert hall. It was a life of, of tremendous achievement that was based in making great music locally. And from there, he was able to give a gift to the rest of the world. And that's, that's a wonderful legacy and a wonderful story. So uh, a salute to Maestro Abravanel and to the fabulous discographic legacy that he left us. Keep on listening, folks. Thank you and take care.